Welcome to the Kyperion Commentary Podcast. This is episode 133. I'm Rick Davis, and I have with me uh, Michael Foster, a man who who needs no introduction. Uh, he's written uh, a couple of books, and you've probably uh, heard of him or seen him on social media. Uh, the reason I'm having Michael here today is because recently his church announced uh, a new project, a, a new um I guess, fellowship of churches uh, that he is starting called uh, Boniface Fellowship. And so, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Episode 133. That's impressive. You've been going yeah. at it, man. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been going at it since about episode 108. So this was okay. this was actually Yuri Brito's podcast for about 10 on. years, and then I stole it from him. I beat him up in an alleyway and took it. So now it's mine. Well done. Well yeah. Done. So, uh, first question: um, How dare you? <laughs> Just kidding. So this yeah. is uh, this is something that you know the the Boniface Fellowship since you announced it, and uh, you know since there have been some changes in in the Series C Constitution last fall, there have been uh, sort of folks online wanting to to see a fight and wanting to you know say, oh, see, this is the CREC imploding. We all knew Doug Wilson was bad news and this is all bad stuff. And this is the end of everything. Um, partly why I wanted to get you on here is because I think what you're doing is a good thing. I'm a CREC guy. Um, and and there's, yeah, I just wanted to sh say there's, there's no competition here. Uh, adults can have different philosophies of ministry and still fellowship with each other and get along greatly. So that's partly why I wanted you on here was just to say, I want to promote what you're doing because it looks good. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. So um, for us, Boniface Fellowship started as an idea about two and a half years ago. I, I was floating um, some of the ideas online, some of the early branding, uh, because we had saw that a lot of Reformed churches in particular are not good at church planting. Mm. <laughs> so that the way they approach church planting is uh, – Usually get a couple families together that have share some niche views. Like these are views that are fun, like a particular worship style, or you have to have classical Christian education or um, es eschatology or, or something, things that they're not wrong or whatever, but they're generally not what you build a church around. Um, and those families will come together, whoever has the most, um, kids and money and rough gravitas becomes an elder and then they call some guy to be a pastor and that happens in all sorts of reformed churches it doesn't matter if it's series c or an a Park church or reformed baptist church this is very common for it to start that way and i that's not the ideal way to start uh certainly most churches that start that way fail to ever really uh, become vital they may exist with like 15 20 people um, for years and years, but not ever add any souls uh, beyond that. So we wanted to uh, put together a, a sort of church planning network uh, was the original conception behind Boniface uh, with a focus on the Midwest region. So really Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio. Uh, so that was an idea I was developing. And then uh, when it became clear that some of the differences in sacramental practices and views on sacramental re reciprocity could be an issue. We just went ahead and shelved it for a moment right. uh, to kind of figure out where all that was going to fall in our own denomination. And uh, then I was on um, sacramental uh, cooperation committee in the series C and going into church council. It, it was clear to me, like, one of the, one of the directions it was going to potentially go. So, um, yeah. and, and, and those directions weren't, and it work went far. there. <laughs> it did. It did. And yeah. it actually almost went a more intense direction, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, and so we knew that was happening and we knew like I, one way I explain it to people is if you think of denominations, you can think of them as kind of having three buckets, mm -hmm. what culturally common, generally expected and constitutionally required. Um, we were well aware of the culturally common things and even the generally expected things when we came in, and we were willing to live in tension for that. Some of the things that were in those buckets are kind of moved over one, 
things that are culturally common are becoming generally expected. Things that are generally expected, uh, at least as it relates to transfer members now are constitutionally required. I think that's natural as mm -hmm. a church is, or denominations kind of bring us, it's like centering on all focus or whatever. Um, so I'm not upset about that at all. Uh, but uh, so that that's kind of helped Boniface evolve too, because right. there are churches that are more uh, credo uh, Baptist or credo communion that would take, uh, have issues with, some of that sacramental reciprocity, but do want some fellowship, some accountability, and also a sort of local focus. I think denominations really struggle when they go national. Right. But the culture is different. The South is different than the Midwest. Uh, the two mm -hmm. coasts are different. Uh, whether you're in an urban area, suburban area, or rural area, all that stuff really impacts how you do ministry. And uh, so I think we underestimate the cultural differences uh, that exist when you move outside a certain region. So we wanted something that was more focused on sort of Midwest Appalachian culture. Appalachian is kind of a weird like area, but right. it's still the culture. <laughs> um, and uh, so we uh, started to develop Boniface Fellowship in earnest again uh, at the end of last year. And right now it's an initiative. It doesn't really exist. Um we would want we want four churches to join us mm -hmm. uh, that have you know at least one pastor, two elders, financially stable, and have constitution and bylaws that include either uh, uh, the London, Second London Baptist or uh, the Westminster Standards. And the reason for that is that Second London Baptist right, is a version of uh, Savoy, which is a version of uh, the Westminster. So they share all the uh, tons of similar right. language. You know, it's so close that on, on many things that you could probably, there's less bumps there. So, um, but the, the real purpose behind it is we want to support pastors. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other people out there, like there's a group called Credo Alliance. Um, uh, Jeff Wright's doing that. And that, that group, as I understand it, and I could be corrected on this, it's definitely a little more focused on straightforward cultural renewal through supporting abolitionism, through uh, supporting classical Christian education, kind of political political involvement. That's actually not the focus of Boniface Fellowship. I think mm -hmm. cultural change happens primarily uh, through Christians being equipped to do the work of the ministry, to be salt and light through godly pastors who rightly preach the word, administer the sacraments, and practice church discipline. I think if you support pastors in that general work, and help them build strong churches, the, the cultural renewal stuff will flow out of those churches. And, um, and so with us, Boniface is really uh, a regional fellowship of reformed churches that are, we wanted to focus on supporting the elders in raising up uh, future pastors, whether for church planting or for their own fellowships, helping them uh, do the examinations, credentialing, uh, one thing they do in Amazon that's really smart, in Amazon, they'll have someone uh, that is in a different department mm -hmm. interview your hire. The, the, and the reason they do that is sometimes you're desperate and you'll hire someone you shouldn't. But someone from another department, I don't need this guy, right? They're just going to ask, do they fit the Amazon culture? Do they have the skills? It's wise to have other pastors come in and help you choose good officers, Right. Like just kind of ratify it, be a sounding board and say, yeah. hey, you sure you want this guy? You know, uh, because a lot, one of the biggest problems in churches is giving away authority to unqualified elders. And right. there's there's an incredible burden on the back of pastors to hand off authority because uh, no one wants to really be seen as an authoritarian tyrant. And so you feel this pressure to hand this mm -hmm. off. But, man, you hand that off too quick, and especially in a church plant or a smaller church. I mean, the damage it can do is intense. So helping people there, uh, and then just a general encouragement that you can create, uh, that you can share as people are doing phone calls and create like an online forum, that's helpful. But also mediation, like a have a mediation where if you have a member or a session member who has a problem, uh, what we would require them to do is submit a form that shows how it's a violation mm -hmm. of the constitution and bylaws. Um, and and also demonstrate that you've exhausted all the existing steps 
in your local church. And if it right. is, if it's dual membership church, let's say you're in the uh, PCA or something like that, that you've gone through all the methods laid out in the book of church order to resolve that. And then we would come in, it's voluntary mediation. Uh, you say, here's what we believe happened. Uh, uh, and then if they're in the wrong, you give them a period of time. Uh, that is the the church to correct it. They don't correct it after some period of time. You could disfellowship them mm -hmm. and you could then publish why you did what you did. I would say one distinction I make between denominations and conference or conferences, networks, fellowships, you know, one, one uh, distinction I make, and this is probably the Scottish Presbyterian in me, but is denominations can actually defrock pastors. We don't mm -hmm. have that. We won't have that power, mm -hmm. right? We'll have the power to de right. fellowship churches because a fellowship can only take that which it confers, which is membership in the fellowship. Right. So that's kind of the general idea. That's what we're going for. It's really more about supporting mm -hmm. pastors. You know, I think the three things that are a big deal to me and I think are to other people would be uh, first is this biblical localism. Uh, I, I hate denominational politics. I hate, especially when they're national. Right. And, um, and one of the things that kind of annoys me about the current situation, I mean, with the CREC, <laughs> is I'm, I make everyone mad on both sides mm -hmm. where pay the communion is wrong. It's not logical. I'm against it. Pay the communion is not quite the heresy that people make it to be. I think it's, uh, an error. So I'm not willing to burn down all my relationships with my paid communist friends because I think it's, I just think it's an error. Uh, at the same time, I'm not going to do it. So I'm kind of like in the middle on these things. Right. Like there tends to be sort of hardcore anti-federal vision, nay park types, or then you've got the, the kind of flip side, like you're starving our children. You're going to go to hell because of, you know, <laughs> you like, you have right. these like extreme types. And I'm like, I don't want to be in either one of those camps. But what's more important to me is like, this is not an issue in my church, right? Like right. we're we're a bunch of uh, suburban, rural Midwesterners. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't, they the word catechism, like how's that not Catholic, right? Confession, how that, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, so, <clears throat> um, if it was more of an issue in my church, certainly would get my attitude, uh, my would perk me up. But I think a lot of times in these national denominations, you're like overwhelmed with issues that aren't actual issues in your locale. Like when I was in the PCA, we were dealing with Greg Johnson and Reed Voice, and uh, that's a major issue. But dude, it was not an issue in Calvary Prez down in the South. Right. Right. It was far away. Uh, so if you want to think about it like a human body, yeah, there was a really nasty wound on another arm. Uh, but the sept, the, it, it could go septic, but it would not get to us way down on the opposite side toe. Like we're far away. Right. So you are in our church now talking about Greg Johnson and Revoice all the time. Mm -hmm. And our people are like, what the heck is a gay celibate Christian? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. So now you're making people think about things that they don't even care about. It's like kinism. I don't talk right. about kinism in my church. It's not a problem. No, no, no one knows what it is. Like I'll, I'd like to keep it that way. You know, yeah. And so one thing that I think is a challenge for all national denominations is mm -hmm. how do we stay locally focused and and mm -hmm. make sure we're talking to the people about like like out here in Cincinnati, we have tons of Pentecostalism and charismatic churches are, are an issue. I was really shocked when I was down in Greenville, South Carolina, how uh, how few there are down there. Yeah. Right? It's Baptist country. It's actually kind of Presbyterian country. Um, so, you know, you don't have to really talk about charismatic errors down there as much as you do up here. And so localism for a pastor is like making sure, okay, is this a national issue I need to be involved in? Right. And am I getting siphoned away from my church? So that'd be the first thing. I think Second, also, if I can yeah. you know, speak yep. to that just really quickly, I think that's something the CREC is trying to figure out right now, too, yep. uh, because we're in the position where technically we call ourselves Presbyterian, but the Presbyteries don't ordain anybody. The local church ordains 
the presbytery examines a candidate and, you know, as it sounds like it's going to happen in Boniface Fellowship, can recommend him and say, yeah, we think he's good. Uh, but the presbytery can't defrock. So the, the CREC was set up as as kind of a loose confederation, I think was the word they used initially, a confederation yeah. of churches. And then that got into some trouble down in the South. So, you know, let's call it something <laughs> different. But uh, again, right, <laughs> local local things can be different. But, um, you know, when we're when we're talking at a national level, uh, that was a big question in the sacramental decision was, you know, do we punt this to local churches and let them decide? Or do we say, no, this is something that this is what it means to be CREC. Yeah. Um, and so those things, you know, the bigger you get, the the more you have to figure them out. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I can feel that pressure as well. Um the relationships at a local level with your pastors, you see right. them and you see the state of their churches and the mm. members move around. It's a little easier to work it out where there's that real established relationship yeah. too. Right. You know? um, <clears throat> that's a problem that everyone runs into. Uh, for us, it's, you know, that, that was something we just want to plant locally. We understand the mm -hmm. Midwest pretty well. And right. Um, so then the other thing is what we call blue collar confessionalism, mm -hmm. you know, which is just, we think people are hungry for historic biblical Christianity. Um, but it needs to be translated into the culture of the day, or at least the forms of mm -hmm. the day. And uh, so, you know, it, sometimes you got to use isms, right? Sometimes you have to use words like Trinity um, uh, to explain things, but right. If you start throwing around, you know, are you uh, a realist, postmillennialist? You know, <laughs> you start throwing all this right. stuff around, people are gonna say, "I don't know what they're talking about." Maybe these are happy; these are great people, but we don't really belong here, right? You people will mm -hmm. kind of detach, and I think there's a lot of people that have awakened and are looking for this stuff and uh, having the discipline to recover historic biblical Christianity and then deliver mm -hmm. it in a language uh, that people understand the form is something that yeah. we care about. So if you come to our church, you'll see a Geneva, a Genevan uh, liturgy for mm -hmm. the most part, what we use. And uh, you'll, you'll hear me quote the shorter catechism almost every Sunday without telling people I'm doing it. Right. And I'll just use the form like, well, what, what does sanctification mean? Right. Well, it's a work of, you know, God's free. Right. And so you just, you actually mm -hmm. teach them to think this way. And, or when we say, you know, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Every once in a while, I'll do, we will rock you. You know, the boom, boom. Right. I say, look, when you guys go to the concert, you'll do that. And that's real. And you mean it. And, and you use your body and worship. And so, and you do the wave. You, we, uh, you know, da -na, da -na, da -na, charge, like we all do that. Right. So uh, I'll use that to start to introduce them to recitation and mm -hmm. kneeling and standing and arms up, all that. And say, so you all do this already, okay? You just save it for sports. That's where you're right. really passionate. You know course. the liturgy of the stadium. Yeah, you do. Yeah, the exactly. church, right? So taking the time to introduce that to people and recognizing that it's, you know, church reform takes centuries. Mm -hmm. And we have people these days that are trying to move everything at just lightning speed, mm -hmm. you know, and we're, we're more patient. We, we have a hundred year view for our church. Um, our goal is uh, that we'll really see the, our vision start to take form with dim eyesight, right. Mm -hmm. and, we'll, and be like Moses looking into the right. promised land. And so that sort of blue collar confessionalism, a confessionalism that works. Problem right. with reform people is they love ideas. Mm -hmm. right? They love the abstract and the theoretical. They attract uh, accountants and lawyers and coders. They attract the minds that love these sort of things. And it just has to translate in the real world. So we just yeah. we don't care so much about socioeconomics, but the idea of getting your hands dirty, right? right. It's a confessionalism that does stuff. So that'd be uh, the, la the second thing. The last would just be a Baptist flexibility flexibility with Presbyterian groups. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, and a lot of that exists in the series C. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot that we, we have in common. So I, I just would tell people um, 
you can be friends with a lot of people, but you can't be roommates with everyone. Right. right. There's different levels of, you know, sometimes one way to end a friendship is to be roommates or to start a business together. And so there's a difference in levels of co-laboring. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, those are some thoughts. Right. Good stuff. Um, you know, one thing I've appreciated about, uh, we, we've talked about this before, um, but just about the idea of, I want to be so plain vanilla reformed. Let's look at the confession and the catechism and just work it because they're very practical, especially if you look at the larger catechism, it's super practical and broken down. It's, you know, you look at the Ten Commandments, here's what you do. And, you know, in every area of your life. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's a really good thing to aspire to because people can come from wherever they are and get plugged into that. And I've noticed as you were talking about idea people, I, I love Peter Lightheart. I love James Jordan. Yeah. But when somebody comes to the reformed faith via James Jordan, there's usually a lot of weirdness there, a lot missing. Or like yeah. even, you know, you read Rush Dooney, a lot of great stuff in Rush Dooney, but when someone becomes reformed because they read Rush Dooney <laughs> or, or even Van Til, there's going to be lopsidedness yeah. versus just start with the Westminster Confession. When you have that good solid groundwork laid, if you're the type of person that likes to speculate, then move on to the that stuff, right? That's the more advanced stuff versus 100%. ordinary people don't even really need that. They need... Yeah, you know, what is the chief end of man? And move, start from Apostles' there. Creed, right? The Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, right? That's yeah. like those are the things constantly that reform people build their systematics mm -hmm. around and teach. Uh, those those are things that people need to know, and uh, and those overlap into most uh, Protestant tra uh, traditions. It's an area that we should have in common, and right. You know, I think we should all remember. Like even take some of the stuff with me in the series. See, there's just a lot of people online that like the bluster. Right, like actual pastors are friends. They they know how to make phone calls mm -hmm. and work things out. And we live in an age where uh, propaganda is so thick. And mm -hmm. what we see online, everyone just needs to remember that's like the that's the orange juice before it's it's concentrate before it's been slipped into the pail of water. It's not. Right. It's not that thick. These are. Like for every crazy James Jordan dude, that's like, uh, you know, I, I always tell friends that James Jordan is like LSD, right? It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> want to write an album or something to drop a little bit, but uh, right. um, that hermeneutical maximalism is not my flavor. But um, for every crazy guy like that, you go to a CRC church or a PCA church. I'm going to tell you that the average person in the pew is way sim more similar than people realize they are. They right. really are. And, and if the pastor is a good pastor, what he cares about is the people in front of him more than anything. We just got to be careful not to let the internet mm -hmm. delocate us. And that's what we're up against right now, getting delocated where our, our minds are elsewhere. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we it's an exciting time. I think mm -hmm. people looking for uh, all these different versions of, of uh, historic biblical Christianity. Some want more of a high church. Uh, I think that's a good inclination. And uh, there's, you know, like with denominations, if you think about, um, I, I kind of lean evangelical reunion, John Frame, but I'm mm -hmm. not, everyone's like, I don't think we should create new denominations. First off, the PCA is only 50 years old. Second off, the Series C and Acts 29 both were founded in 1998. So let's not right. forget, these are <laughs> new denominations. Why, uh, mm -hmm. like historically speaking, they are. Uh, second, if you if you have a hundred churches, and people always they don't like this argument, but I think it's solid. If you have a hundred churches that are independent, and fifty of them join together, uh, united around a creed and some practices, mm -hmm. you went from a hundred functional denominations, individual churches, to fifty one. Right, right. So I think people banding together around mm -hmm. a common creed and practice is good for America. Mm -hmm. I think. America is culturally balkanized in different ways and seeing little fellowships, little denominations pop up and, and start to focus on building those relationships between those would be a good move for America. Right. You know? And, and I think what I'm seeing now is, you know, whereas with the older mainline denominations, they were very exclusive. Um, 
what I'm seeing popping up with things like Boniface and even the CREC, FORC, is that you might have memberships in multiple associations or groups based on different things. Okay, we're in the CREC because you know we we like covenant renewal worship, you know, sacramental unity, that sort of thing. Uh, we're in this other group because we want to fight cultural issues and that's what they're all about. And so we're part of that group. And you could be, you know, a member of, you know, we have some CREC churches that are also uh, SBC, right? You know, they're coming into yeah. CREC and SBC. Uh, what, you know, uh, those uh, things can happen. Be interesting how that plays out. <laughs> I know, but I couldn't have seen that, you know, how you couldn't have seen that happening a hundred years ago with the mainline denominations. Uh, so I think that focus on localism is a big deal. And, and so when you talk about things like this, you're like, how's this anything different? How's this going to fix anything? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just say, look, man, I don't where, where did you hear me or anyone else say that we figured it out and this is going to fix everything? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like I, I think we're trying to, what we should be doing is working together as much as possible with Christians uh, that are like minded and there's different levels of like mindedness. And, and, and try to work these things out. Like, I don't uh, claim to have all this stuff figured out. And, um, you know, I look at Presbyterianism, Scottish Presbyterianism would be what I am most persuaded is taught in scripture, uh, where, you know, the CRC is more of a Dutch model. It's much more mm -hmm. like kind of the URC or something like that. Um, but, uh, but even with Presbyterianism, if you combine Presbyterianism and postmillennialism, it, it does like, what, what do you do if, Think about like the P uh, PCA is 300,000 members, about 1,600 churches. And so you got like 4,500 uh, pastors showing up to general GA. And uh, okay, so how are those elders involved in making decisions? They barely right. are. But let's just say there's a revival of Presbyterianism, right? And and it grows tenfold, right? 45,000 elders. How do you have 45,000 elders making decisions <laughs> without uh, moving a more Episcopalian hierarchical direction. How does Presbyterian scale at a national or global level if you're post right. and it's like, I don't really know how that stuff works out. And yeah. and so you look at the series C and they're like, yeah, they kind of see it. So there's like all these mixtures. It's like, we have a private <laughs> minister. But he's not an archbishop. He presides, you know, it's influential, right. but it's not. It's, you know, we they have delegates and all this it's interesting and i get how it's got there right i don't think let's just get out of the next couple of decades maybe let's do that right and, and everyone that's gonna fix the world and fix everything you know I'll, I'll keep watching and i'll learn from afar as you do that you know right well and also i think you know in terms of denominations um uh, people get really attached to them and think they have to be forever things and you'll have people who are like, well, I'm sticking to the UMC because my granddad and great granddad were UMC or whatever. You know, I, I want the CREC to flourish and last forever. It probably won't. And um, and that's OK. In God's providence, the church moves on. Individual denominations come, go, merge, split. You know, these things happen. The kingdom moves on. And that's the picture that we're looking at. Right. The kingdom of God continues and advances. So good stuff. Um, so before we go, we're, we're running low on time, but I want to be able to say, uh, so this coming Monday, which is the 13th, you've got an, an informational meetup about Boniface Fellowship. Uh, do you want to say anything about that or? Yeah, so we're just, all? it's, I'm just going to walk through the conception, the things that we think matter, uh, a timeline of events. We're going to, uh, uh, I've got an advisory a board that I've set up with someone from the SBC, PCA, and actually CREC. Uh, that's as we create this sort of minimal viable product, you know, it's like, right. here's our base <laughs> level of our constitution. But so introducing the main concepts and ideas to the interested churches, about 30 of them right now. And, uh, and then do follow-up phone calls for the, the, the pastors that have questions or concerns and then uh, I'm meeting with those. Uh, I'm running all these early uh, revisions past this advisory board. Like, what do you guys think? You know, am I crazy? Does this make sense? What would you do? Um, and then we'll hopefully have a, a, a version of that done to present as a first uh, with a first reading of the Constitution at our Guts and Grace conference okay. uh, this 
fall. And then assuming we have four churches that meet those baseline uh, requirements, um, then we'll move ahead with something like a constitutional convention next year and and then go ahead and uh, so someone's kind of got to spearhead this thing to get it going um my purpose in this world is nick fury kind of my spiritual mm -hmm. gift i just build <laughs> teams and keep people on mission um right. and uh that's what i'm good at and uh so we're trying to br make sure one problem i see in these little groups that form is there's always kind of like some big figurehead and larger mm -hmm. church that dominates everything Right. We want to try to avoid that to the best of our ability. So bringing on uh, in our first sort of phase, healthy, stabilized churches that also, you know, have have some oomph to them uh, would will help keep it a more balanced um, fellowship, at least at the get go and keep us from getting mired in controversy out the gate, which I've watched two Presbyterian denominations form in the last six years. And one of them divided within two years or yeah. twice within three years. And you're like, oh, my gosh. And they had everything figured out. Right. Book order, strict, strict subscriptionists. And then it all like blew up. And that just tells you it's the quality of your men. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you if you're not like minded and, and love one another and respect one another and fear God, there is no uh, constitution. There is no paperwork documents that will can overcome that. You have to really have like-minded, God-fearing pastors, or there is no hope. You know. Right. Well, I pray that everything goes well for you, and I hope it comes together. Um, Michael, thanks for being here. Thank you. Join us. I'm going to post information about Boniface Fellowship in the notes below so that you can check that out. And thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.